today's show for Classroom 2.0 Live. Today's topic is assessments that don't suck. Hope the hosts for the show are Peggy George, Lori Moffitt, and Tammy Moore. I'm Lori Moffitt. Thanks again to Tammy for doing the closed captioning. Our special guest is Paul, Paul Bogish, who has finally been able to log in. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Carolyn Stanley, who will introduce Paul now, and then ask the newbie question on the next slide. I will be capturing questions during the show. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> we certainly hope that everything's going to work, because I know that you'll be blown away by what Paul has to say. Uh, he's an amazing educator. Paul teaches social studies at Moran Middle School in Wallingford, Connecticut. I think he's been teaching eighth grade for years, but it looks like he's going to seventh grade this year. For years, he has been on the cutting edge of using technology to enhance student learning and engagement. He has served on various committees, such as the Technology Steering Committee and the Moran Innovation Team. And he helped teachers transition to becoming a Google Apps for Education school. I first met Paul when he and his wife came to see me at my school, where I was the tech integration specialist. And their daughter was going to be entering seventh grade in a few weeks' time. And I helped to assure them that she would be entering a good learning environment. And that did prove the case. Uh, she was a wonderful girl, by the way. I started following Paul's blog and was very impressed by the ways that he was using collaboration and communication technology tools to make his classroom cutting edge. I was also impressed with the way he treated his students as individuals and gave them voice and self-confidence. And much of his work inspired mine. Uh, Paul wants. Uh, would especially like uh, this introduction to be made that a student wrote for him. So this is in the student's words. Paul Bogish is a remarkable man. His teaching methods are fun and unique, and he makes every class enjoyable. His energetic mood is infectious, and you can't help but smile around him. He's very genuine and is not strict or boring like other teachers. Everything he says is always stuck in your mind because he delivers everything with boldness and confidence. He's an all-around incredible person and makes learning 10 times more fun than any other class. He will be dearly missed by not just me, but most of his students when we leave next year. Now, I'm to ask the newbie question here. Peggy, I'm not sure how to go to the next page. Can you change this? Thank you. All right, what is the difference between formative assessment and summative assessment is the newbie question. So please welcome from Connecticut, Paul Bogish, seventh grade social studies teacher, part-time farmer, and someone who aspires to be as great as his students think he is. Thank you very much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Um, instead of trying to rush, I'll just get through a little bit less. Uh, and to start off with that newbie question, what's the difference between a formative assessment and a summative assessment? Uh, I think a very easy way to think about it is formative is ongoing and summative comes at the end. So formative is that thing that you give throughout a unit uh, that kind of guides the ongoing instruction and a summative would be something that's given at the end of a unit. Um, and I would kind of argue that uh, there really should be no such thing as, and now I'm going to go express. Here we go. So you've got seven, se seven tenths of a second to make a first impression with your kids, and I would argue that you have that same amount of time with anything you introduce into your class. And so if you introduce a, a test, who the heck really wants to do a test at the end of the unit, right? And so I think we need to start thinking a little bit differently about things. And when I was standing up in front of the class, you know, I started to watch my kids' faces as I introduced units. And if you kind of take a step outside of your body and look back at your kids and see what they're seeing, you know, do they have a look of awe or do they have a look at boredom when, they're introduced, when you're introducing a new unit, which they all know is going to ultimately end with a test or a quiz that 
they have to memorize things for. And so, you know, I wanted them to be these hard workers, you know, we use words, all the buzzwords, imaginative, innovative, have grit, and I really wasn't giving them anything to be imaginative and have grit about. Who would really want to put in a lot of perseverance and determination to simply memorize a bunch of stuff, um, especially if you know that the first two weeks of every unit is going to be spent taking in content, and then the last week will be memorizing it and spinning it back. Um, I, then I also, my daughters started to grow up, those are my two kids, and I started to take a look at how they were learning naturally and not just, they weren't learning the way that we teach in school. And so I really started to alter things. And I started also work at Old Sturbridge Village. That is me at Old Sturbridge Village. And through all of my research, I realized that these people knew so much stuff in order to survive, and nobody sat down and did it through, you know, quizzes and tests and took notes and all of that stuff. Um, you know, it all had a real purpose. It all had a, a real reason for happening, and kids just absorbed it by working side by side with adults. And when I went, again, every time I look back at my students, if you notice the girl at least in the middle like that, that's the sort of face I wanted to see when I was introducing my assessments. And unfortunately now, this is literally my uh, scores from my district assessment. I did it in front of the kids on the board so they could see what I do behind the scenes. And nowadays, you know, district assessments that we're being forced to do, it kind of just turns all of the kids into these dash marks and different scores. And again, you know, who, who would want to be motivated by that? It definitely didn't make my kids happy. It made them hate learning. And it definitely wasn't going to get them to be ready to hold up the world later in their life. And so I started to kind of say to myself, you know what? The kids are going to be exactly who I am and not who I want them to be. And so I got to take the way that I learn and my own kids learn and bring that into the classroom. And that's when I really started changing uh, how I assess the kids. This slide makes me cringe because <laughs> any of my students would tell me to stop talking right now because I have a rule in class that says if you put a sentence on a slide and you go up and present, you have to automatically sit down. Um, but I just wanted to put it up there because I know that this is used for reference and people kind of come back to it. So I'm just going to kind of go through some of the things that I think makes an assessment not suck. And by the way, Peggy, thank you for allowing me to use that word. Um, for anyone listening, Peggy had a reservation about using the word suck in the title. So it, I pushed her on it, and it's, it's my fault. So if anyone's offended, um, please email me and not Peggy. Um, the, the first thing I think you need to think about is that it promotes learning, and it doesn't simply measure it. You know, it's, it's kind of the classic story of the farmer who only worries about weighing his animals and not feeding them. And if all you're worried about weighing them, um, you know, you're going to end up with some sick animals. Um, the next thing is grades are not the goal. I think if you're talking about grades in your class, you've already failed. Um, nobody's going to work want to work for a grade, and the kids that are working for grades, they're not achieving the way they could if they got grades out of their mind. Um, I also think that a great assessment is part of the process of living. It's not something for the future. Uh, anytime you introduce something in your class saying you're going to need this for, and you mention the next class, or you mention some point in their life, everybody gets turned off because the reality is nobody listens when you say you need something for the future. People listen when you need it now. Um, I'm going to kind of skip down a little bit to where it says students learn more about themselves uh, than they do about the content. Uh, I, I think if you have great assessments and you have a great class, by the end of the year, kids didn't learn more about the content of the class, but they learned more about themselves. And so each uh, assessment that you give is kind of a, a self-reflection kind of built in where they kind of become stronger and know more about themselves. Um, to kind of skip down to where it says contingencies, uh, contingencies are built in to address kids' weaknesses and their fears. Uh, I think too often we just kind of push, 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 push through and we forget to kind of work in and, you know, kids are afraid of doing different things and we don't really help them out with that. And uh, I'm going to do two more of these. The one that says assessment is not destined for the garbage can. Um, if you think about any assessment you gave last year, how many of them were not automatically destined for the garbage can? Um, and I don't mean even simply just recording something and sticking it on a wall, but how many had value to the rest of the world? How many of them can make a dent in the rest of the world? Um, and one other one on there uh, I just want to mention before I go on is that if you are not doing your assessments with your kids, that is the number one thing you can do to improve your assessments. Um, you know, for example, for me, I'm a social studies teacher, so I spent four years of college 
I spent two years with a master's and two years of a six-year degree. Uh, I've spent my entire life teaching social studies, and if I wouldn't want to do the assignment that I give to them, why the heck would they want to do it? And so I, I think you really got to think about that. And if you haven't done the assessments with your kids or any assignment, you have no idea what they're going through. So without further ado, I have not been glancing at the chat. Is there anything I should have noticed? I'll look quickly right now. Um, but without further ado, uh, let's get started with some different assessments. And Peggy, I realize I'm short on time, so uh, you let me know. I'll, I don't know, you might have to write it 10 times in the chat, but let me know when I got to cut it. All right. And a lot of these are video-based. Um, they don't have to be, uh, but I think they're most un easily understood watching the videos. And so I know I saw in the chat um, my blog was listed in there. Um, I think most of these are listed on a blog post that's 24 assessments that don't suck. And so I'd highly recommend looking at some of the videos. Um, the first one is RSA videos. Uh, RSA videos started a few years ago. I have a screenshot of the most, I think the most viewed one, which is with Ken Robinson. And basically what you're doing is you're taking a narration and you're putting words in uh, to it, or you're adding words to it. And it's kind of a, it sounds very complicated, and when you kind of look at my blog post on it, it looks sort of complicated. Um, but once you start doing it, you'll see that it's not. Um, basically, the kids first start taking notes. And if you can see the notes on the right-hand side of the page, we do them in steps because we use the analogy that every step connects to the previous one, which connects to the next one. So when you're taking notes, all of your notes should kind of connect and build and build and build. And if you look underneath the stairs, you'll see some facts about each main point. And we kind of say that each stair has to be supported. So each of your notes has to be supported with facts. And then what they have to do is they turn their notes into images. And you can see this student's uh, first brainstorm of images, what each stair would be turned into. And then what they do is they, they literally doodle out the entire story. Uh, I believe the one you're looking at here is from the Louisiana Purchase. And, uh, you know, Louisiana Purchase is not the most exciting uh, topic to engage kids with, at least for me. I'm sure somebody out there might have a better idea. Um, and so when we did the RSA project with it, uh, the kids really had to dive into it to understand what was going on and it how it was complicated and, and turn that into images. And the process of turning any words into images really lets the kids kind of play with the information and, and let them process it. Um, and, you know, it takes a few days to do. And each step along the way, they're reprocessing and reprocessing and reprocessing the information, you know, first from the text, then into their notes, then into simple images, then into more complex uh, images, and then finally into a narration. And so, you know, unlike, say, a normal class where you write something down, and then you kind of go back to it to memorize it later on. This is a, a whole week of just playing with information. And I noticed somebody said huge whiteboards. Um, here's a great deal. If you go to any kind of hardware store, um, you know, even a big box one like a Home Depot or Lowe's, you can get a sheet of shower board for about 12 bucks. Uh, have them cut it into four pieces. And that's basically what you're looking at right there. And actually, if you look at the one at the top with the U in it, I actually took that from my daughter who had it in her room around a plug. Um, but they're, they're usable for so many things, so storyboarding for videos or, uh, or anything. Um, the melamine, or melamine, if I saw Maureen wrote that in there. I don't think it's the same exact thing. Uh, that's more expensive. <laughs> uh, so I went with the cheap stuff. And someone told me that it's against the law for them to cut it in a store, and so basically I went in and uh, before I even said to him what I wanted, I said, hi, I'm a teacher, you know, you kind of work that up, could you cut these for me? And uh, they didn't question it in a, a couple stores that I went. Um, and again, the supplies for this are pretty low. Um, we did this with some very simple cameras. You can do it with a whole more complicated way, um, but su supplies are pretty limited. Some kids use the whiteboard, some kids did it on paper. Um, I actually love the kids who did it uh, like this. Oh, you can't use, see my pointer, I guess. Um, but so when they were done, you're able to see the entire story. Some kids wrote, then erased, then wrote, then erased. But I like the kids who did it all as one. And what you're looking at on this slide is actually their practice session. So they had to do this a, a few times. All right. 
Um, and there's a, a screenshot from a video of me doing mine. Uh, and again, I can't just stress so much that you got to do these things with your kids. Otherwise, you will have no idea where they're having trouble. There's been so many things I've done that when I'm doing it with the kids, I'll literally say to them, that's just stupid. I don't even know why I put that in the directions. Just eliminate it. All right, note card confessions. Um, it was funny, I was at Ed Camp, Connecticut yesterday and in a session and someone was talking about how they do note card confessions with their kids and I was like, oh man, I do that too. And she's like, yep, uh, that's where I got it from you. Uh, so she was a foreign language teacher and note card confessions uh, are a super simple thing. Um, if you look around the internet and just type that in, uh, you're going to see that they started with teenage girls and a lot of emotional angst. Um, exposing everything from uh, problems with their parents to suicide to being bullied. And they're, so they're very emotional, very deep sort of things that gets you into the head of the person who is doing it. And since they're note cards, each thought has to be short and succinct and, and to the point. And I kind of stumbled upon it totally by accident. We were doing a music video for the Monroe Doctrine. Um, you might have seen that on MTV lately. Uh, and I had a couple of girls who wanted to add in something a little bit different. And I don't know whether we all came up, the three of us came up with the idea together. I think it was one of them who kind of brought it up first. And she said, well, you know, you ever see those girls on YouTube and they're kind of exposing themselves? What if we did a video as America? Like America would be having this huge emotional discharge about what they felt it was like to be going through the Monroe Doctrine and, and putting off the other uh, the hemispheres. And so they did this video. You can see one girl was America. Um, she talked about her self-confidence issues. And it was just, it was somewhat hysterical, but at the same time incredibly serious. And it was just phenomenal. Um, after they did that one, it was the very next unit that we did. We, the whole team stole the idea. and. <laughs> Sorry, Jackie. <laughs> I saw that in the chat. I'll, I'll remember that for the next one. Um, and so what we did is the Trail of Tears was next, and kids just did some phenomenal ones on what it was like to be a Cherokee Indian on the Trail of Tears and kind of sharing their emotional baggage and, and what it was like. And again, you know, when you look at something like this, if you look at my kids' videos, you're not going to automatically see a ton of research and facts, but what you're going to see is thoughts of Andrew Jackson or thoughts of a uh, Cherokee Indian based on all of that historical information. And, you know, my kids can go back and say, you know, when they wrote this, sure, there's no history in that card, but here's the reason, here's the history the card is based on. Um, we do a lot of music videos, and because, again, I kind of came in late, I'm going to um, cut this one short, uh, but, you know, we're in the, you know, kids love to sing. You know, think about a, 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 a nursery school class, think about a, a kindergarten class, and then all of a sudden, somewhere along the lines, singing is no longer acceptable as a tool in a classroom. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, just like art, kids all of a sudden, oh, I can't sing, I can't do this, I can't do that. Uh, and so, you know, doing music videos is great. Um, and again, if you watch the, some of the, if you look at some of the links, uh, you'll see some great examples of kids. You know, this is Joe, he's a guitarist, and he doesn't get to play his guitar anywhere. And so when he was able to use it for class, that kid worked for a whole week. The hours he put in after school working on his song was absolutely incredible. It was on Daniel Shays. He performed it for the class. And for the next four or five months, you literally hear kids humming his song. Uh, as they were in class or in the hallway. It was a great catchy tune and uh, he'll never forget what happened on uh, uh, in Daniel Shay's Rebellion. Um, there's just another glance of it. And again, we have some, uh, some decent mics and we record it with audacity and we do it like a real music video. So the kids will record the music first and then they'll listen. Right now they're listening to the music and they're singing the lyrics. So Joe is just kind of air guitaring. He's not actually playing it. So it's done just like in, in real life. It's not all done in one, uh, one thing. 
Um, and I put this picture in here just to remind me that <laughs> if I ever had four kids on my team who were the least likely to, to get up and sing and perform a song, uh, these would be some of them. And again, you're going to find kids who aren't brave in so many ways of your class get up and do something like this that and just blow you away because it's their strength and it's their passion, it's their love, and they just basically have to, have to suppress it every year. Uh, and so to unleash it is really awesome. Um, common craft style videos. Uh, there's a lot on the internet out on common craft style videos. There's thousands of examples. Um, and so you can just, you know, a Google search uh, leads you to many of them. Uh, common craft style videos, and I put the style in bold simply because the word common craft belongs to a guy named Lee Lefevre. And so if you're call your videos common craft videos, it's a little bit of copyright infringement. And so Lee has asked that any students and teachers using his style of video put in the word style so that uh, everybody knows it's not from common craft if they do any Google searching. Um, so common craft videos are very similar to the RSA. You're taking something that is written and you're turning it into um, pictures. And again, you know, our, our kids don't create enough. They don't make enough stuff. Um, they do a lot of memorizing, and they do a lot of thinking, and they spit back a lot of thinking. And I, I think schools have gone so overboard with thinking is more important than doing. And we've kind of detached the two somehow. And again, while all of these things that you look at in the common craft videos that my kids make are so darn simple, just the act of deciding what to make and then producing the final video really allows them to process the information and have deeper thoughts than if they just had to answer some deep, essential question um, about uh, the material. And so, again, you know, Common Craft videos, I know I've done this in sessions before where some teachers are put off because it looks like little paper puppet things. Um, I tell you, you do it with any age level. I've done this with... Um, in my uh, master's class, and you know, you have 20 and 30 year olds totally getting into it. Uh, so it's it's awesome. And, and Jackie, Powtoons are a good tool for this type of thing. And here's my issue with Powtoon, and I've I've experimented with Powtoon in a couple of ways. Um, Powtoon, since you can select their objects, there's simply less thought that goes into what's going on. Um, and I have done Powtoons followed by Common Craft thinking that the Powtoon would help the Common Craft and I don't know, I, I haven't seen it. Um, and so I, I don't actually know if I'm going to do Powtoons again. I, I think I'm going to actually do the Common Craft. Um, and I was in a session yesterday where someone showed, showed some other tools in which you could just simply, you know, you open up the, the app on your iPad and you grab the different pictures. And, you know, that's kind of like, I don't know, putting together IKEA furniture. Um, I don't think you get a good sense of, of being a craftsman by putting together IKEA furniture. And that's kind of what a lot of those apps do. It gives you the feeling of putting something together, but you're actually not. Um, and again, it's a big difference. And, and again, you know, it takes them a couple of days and uh, to do all of this, but they're constantly having to reprocess, reprocess, reprocess. It's a good group activity. Um, most kids don't complain about working in groups for this one because the roles can really be uh, uh, split up. Um, the filming can be complicated or simple. Um, it could be as simple as putting a document cam up on a desk and having the kids do it and then just walk away. We film ours and you can see I go a little bit nutto, not so with extra lighting and this, if you look at this object right here where the kid's hand is on, that's actually an old desk I ripped off the top and so the kids prep on the desk and then they bring it up. Um, but again, uh, common craft videos are a cool idea. Just another angle of them filming, and that's from the top down through the camera. Uh, and again, you can even throw your cell phone over a bench and the kids can do it that way. So nothing very complicated. Um, a thousand words. Uh, one day we were talking in class and it came up how a picture has a thousand words. And so we decided to do an assignment. We, we were trying to figure out how to green screen, and we figured this might be a good way to figure it out. And so what we decided to do is each kid stepped into an image. Each group, there was groups of three or four, and they had to give a thousand words that the image was saying. And it was ridiculously awesome. Um, it was unlike any sort of 
uh, primary source uh, image analysis that I had done before, you know, there's, you can throw something on a desk in front of them and they don't own it. Uh, when they have to walk into it and they know that they're standing next to someone, they really slow down and they analyze every little thing uh, in the image. Um, even to the point, if you look at this image, um, I've used this image for a few years, and this girl here uh, noticed that if you look in the back of the image, you can even see some cars parked. So even little things, they'll notice every single little thing. Um, and again, they're doing it green screen, so they really have to analyze the image because when they're up there talking, there is no image. It's just the green screen. So it forces them to really take a look at that picture deeply, see where everything is, see what the details are, so that when they're up there, they could point them out. Um, and there's another picture, too. That's a, a bigger green screen that we installed this year. Um, and green screening is, I thought it was kind of hard to do at first, but uh, there are some simple settings. Um, and in, I think I have that in the blog post. As long as you have some simple settings and your camera figured out, uh, it's not too difficult to pull off. Um, and this is kind of, I put this one in just because it's kind of funny, because they have no idea where they are in the image. They have to know beforehand. So sometimes you have kids kind of making mistakes. So Sean is actually pointing at the sign above his head, but since he couldn't see the image, he kind of missed it. But uh, that's all right. So uh, Amy, the, the, the green sheet was just on Amazon. Um, and the, the smaller one is about 20 bucks, and uh, the bigger one that was in the background, it's actually two of them uh, were $50 each. And that's a simple muslin fabric. Um, an official green screen from a movie, if you just got one the size of a wall of a classroom, would be thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. It's made out of one single uh, die. If you just buy a muslin sheet, um, they're pretty cheap. Um, stop action animation. Uh, I'm not going to go over this one because most people are familiar with it. But it, again, it's something that we don't usually think of or we think of as too simple. Um, and, you know, again, it's something that really engages kids. And on the left, you can see one that was drawn. Uh, and on the right, you see the obviously uh, the Lego one. Um, you can do it with clay. You can do it with a lot of things. And again, it, doing something like this slows the kids down. They just simply have to think more about the content and use more skills than just regurgitating something at the end of the unit. Um, reverse poems are phenomenal. Um, they are so difficult. And I would say when I do them with a class, I have a very low success rate, but nobody cares. Uh, they're a lot of fun to make. And I don't know if it's very small on my screen. Um, I'm going to read the beginning of it just to give you a sense of how it works. So when you read the poem one way, you have the viewpoint of one person. When you read it the other way, you get the viewpoint of someone else. So check this out. You ready? I am part of a lost generation, and I refuse to believe that I can change the world. I realize that this may be a shock, but happiness comes within, from within is a lie, and money will make me happy. So check this out when it's read backwards. Money will make me happy is a lie, and happiness comes from within. I realize this may be a shock, but I can change the word, and I refuse to believe that I am part of a lost generation. And yeah, Maureen, they are ridiculously hard to write, but again, the kids have to play and play and play and play and reprocess and reprocess so many times that it just sucks the content into their head. Um, I've done this with Civil War, so reading it down as a Union soldier, reading it backwards as a Confederate soldier. I've, I've had a student do this with the Cherokee uh, Trail of Tears. So reading it down is the viewpoint of a Cherokee Indian, and reading it backwards is the viewpoint of a soldier. And just, I got goosebumps just thinking of this one. I had a kid um, last year who did one down from the point of view of a slave owner. And so she's up there reading the poem, and it's, you know, it's just, it's ugly. And when she starts to go backwards, and she was on the video, when it starts to go backwards, it's the viewpoint of the slave, and it's just, it's just amazing. Um, it was really, really a cool thing. Um, blackout poems are a really simple thing to do, too. Um, and I will say that this one is, uh, I, don't, I, I can't remember where I got this idea from, but I know there's a few teachers out there that are, are doing this. And basically, the kids get to do something that they never get to do. They break a rule. You get some old books from the library that are in the discard pile, and you let them rip the pages out, which you should just see their faces light up that they're going to do an assessment by ripping pages out of library book. And what you do is you black out the words you don't want. And what's left behind 
are the words that you read. And I've, I've actually, I've saved some of these and then I've shared them with like future, the next year's class and they just don't work that way because in, you, the kid who made it has to read it. And the way that they kind of, uh, I don't know, I think it's like any piece of personal poetry when you have somebody else who didn't write it, read it. Um, or like spoken word poetry, poetry, like from a poetry slam. Um, whoever the, the author is just can't hand that off to someone else to read it because it just doesn't come out the same. Um, but it's really cool stuff. This one I stuck in there because I, I think it's cool. And I always have a couple of uh, kids every year that take me up on this. And usually it takes them to the end. But every class usually has dancers in it. And I'll tell you, the dancers really, if you've ever listened to Ken Robinson tell the story about the girl who was having problems in class, and, you know, it was because she was a dancer and she could never get out that creative side of her in a classroom. Um, I love it when the, and I will say girls because it's always been girls that have done this, um, but when they kind of take me up and they will, you know, they're dancing all these nights of the week and they're happy to kind of bring that into class. And this girl did an interpretive dance of what it was like to be a Civil War soldier. It was based on a, a larger paper that compared Civil War soldiers to American soldiers currently serving in the Gulf. And she analyzed whether it was harder to be a soldier then or now. And her answer came back in this dance, um, blew people away. Um, this is a girl, the only girl I think I've ever taught in 24 years that sat in the same seat every single day for the entire year. And one day she walked out of class and she said, I'm going to work in the hall this week. And we never saw her and I never checked on her. And for five days she worked in the hall and on the sixth day she came back, threw all the desks to the side and uh, did the dance. And if you listen to the video, please do. Uh, she wrote the lyrics to the song um, and uh, sung the lyrics. So it, it's all her. Um, the speech. This is not a complicated one, right? Um, but I think we have gotten so far away to just being able to deliver clear, concise words, and we rely so much on technology and creating digital stories and using these apps and yada, 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 that we've kind of lost teaching how to speak clearly and, and to the point. And if you notice this picture with Caitlin with her hand, we go over how to use your, your body uh, when you're talking and how to use your arms to make a point and how to just, you know, you know the body language and what does it convey besides your, your words. Um, and, you know, this, I'm stuttering only because the next part always makes me nervous. This is another one where you got to do it yourself. I don't care if you've been teaching for 30 years in the classroom, you've never given a presentation to your kids because when you give a presentation, you feel out of control. Um, and so when I've done this, with, when I do this with the kids, I also give a speech. Man, I got to go to the bathroom right before I go. My mouth gets dry and I'm the one who made up the assignment with them. Um, and, you know, we work on being clear. We don't use any pictures. We don't use any computers. We just use our bodies and our words to deliver a very clear and powerful point. Um, and, you know, it, it's something where if you don't do it with them, they'll never be successful. You'll just never, 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 never. Uh, and that is closely connected to Poetry Slam. Um, and again, I'm a social studies teacher. I'm not LA. Um, but you can still use Poetry Slam in LA. We, the one that I like, the subject I like doing it with the best is the Lowell Mill Girls. And uh, everybody will do a Poetry Slam on what it was like to be a, a mill girl. And again, I decided to include a picture of myself instead of the kids just as a reminder that if you're not doing it with them, you have no idea how hard it is and you simply cannot coach them through it. You know, you can't coach them through giving a speech if you've never done one yourself. You can't coach them through doing an RSA video or a poetry, whatever, unless you've done it as well. Um, Peggy, can you throw something in the chat? I'm looking at the time. It's 102. Tell me what you want me to do. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. So this is a brand new one that I did this year, and I love it. Uh, I have no title for it. I don't, it's not Poetry Slam. It's not RSA Video. I don't know. I, I got to come up with something catchy. So right now I'm just sticking with my darling wife. Um, we did, we were doing something on, we were doing research on the Civil War. And, you know, I wanted them to closely analyze 
uh, Civil War soldiers' letters so that they could figure out what it was like to be a soldier in the war. And I think usually when a classroom does that sort of research, they research what a Civil War soldier does, not what it was like to be a Civil War soldier. And the twist that we did with this is that the kids didn't just look at one letter or a few letters. What they did is they looked at uh, something like 24 or 25 letters, and they started looking for patterns. What did all the letters talk about? And what did all the letters, what did all the soldiers write about? What were they all concerned about? Uh, and then what they did is they did a project where they didn't tell the story of a Civil, civil War soldier um, by summarizing. They used all of the words from the letters. So if you listen to that video, all of the words being spoken by the kids are actual words from Civil War soldiers. And there, I think with this group here, there might have been four people in it. So we're talking something like uh, 25 letters that they all finally decided to use. And so you, you, they made one letter out of 25. And in order to do that, they really had to find the common uh, lines that kind of are common, you know, things that kind of ran between the Civil War soldiers' uh, experiences and string them together into one letter. And it was just uh, awesome. I, I really, I can't, I'm totally looking forward to doing that again next year. Um, and I learned so much from this project. Uh, I learned so much. And if I could just address a couple of things. Um, I, I realize that normally when I give them a um, any kind of source, any kind of text, that I'm predicting what they're going to get out of it. So for example, I might have given them a letter to show them what it was like to fight in the war. I might give them a letter to show what it was like to have for medical treatment. When I did it like this with these kids, and I, first of all, I didn't even give them the letters. I had them find them and pick them. They found things and connections that I never saw. Uh, I'll, uh, for a simple example, I, I never realized in all of my years of research that practically every single letter opened up with the Civil War soldier addressing his health. I mean, it's just, you know, it's a small little thing. I never realized, looking at these letters, that so many of them, you know, and you can hear these girls, I think, talk about it, you know, requesting supplies from home. Um, and they, they found patterns that I just never, ever would have seen. Um, but, you know, we had 100 kids researching these things. We had hundreds and hundreds of letters being examined. And, uh, you know, they found stuff about what it was like to be a Civil War soldier that just blew me away. Uh, <laughs> this is awesome. Uh, uh, by the way, I, I know this this um, recording goes up on the in internet, and so all of the images that I used are either mine or they're Creative Commons. This image is not mine, and it's not Creative Commons. So to make this legal, I will use it as critique. So as long as I critique the photo, Peggy, I think you can use this, and no one will sue you. So I think they should have had the picture of him on the left-hand side instead of the right. So there you go. I've critiqued it, and now it's legal to put this on the internet, Peggy. Um, so this is a movie called, uh, this is a TV show called Chopped. And as you see in the background, there's four chefs, and inside of the basket, are all ingredients, and they have no I, oh, uh, Patty, if I can go backwards. Uh, the, my darling wife took about a week, maybe, from start to finish. Um, and so going back to the chopped, the four chefs are standing in front of a basket with ingredients that they've never seen before. And when the guy says go, they open up the baskets, and they have to put together a meal using those ingredients. And obviously, they have to combine the ingredients. They have to flawlessly put them together and make it taste good. And so I kind of used that idea, and I gave the kids a box of items. We were doing, um, geez, I forgot, Louisiana Purchase with this one here this year. and. I put in objects into the box that were obvious primary sources, some that they had seen, some that they knew about. Uh, I put in some primary sources that they had never seen. And then just like on CHOP, I put in some items that just had nothing to do with anything. It was just a kind of a thing to mess with their heads and get them to start being creative with. And so you can see with this one here, they had maps, they had images, they had letters from Napoleon, letters from Jefferson, and they also had a hinge that you can see the kid holding, and they had a baby doll. And they had to put those all into a story about the Louisiana Purchase. Um, 
And you can see he's examining a letter. Um, I can't remember who this is. This is letters from Jefferson. I can't remember who he wrote it to. Uh, but they had to play, put all these things together. What was kind of funny is that I, somehow in the unit, I never showed them a picture of Napoleon. So I just assumed they would know what he looked like. But most people had no idea that this is Napoleon. So it was just like a guy on the horse. And then, they, and then they found out about it. Um, and just like Chopped and Chopped, there's a pantry. And kids can go to the pantry, or uh, contestants can go to the uh, pantry to get different items. And so kids are able to go anywhere in the classroom and get objects uh, to add to their story. So if you can see this class, um, they ended up getting a lot of objects for their story. And then they presented them. Um, this is a, another really cool uh, present. Uh, um, assessment that we did. And each kid, this one here from this picture, I think it fell around revolution unit that we did. And the kids had to take different stories and, and key events from the American Revolution. And they had to kind of think like a museum curator and think of one key object that they would have found that would represent kind of a bigger story and tell the story behind that object. And so if I remember correctly, this object was a kid was doing the founding and creation of Washington, D.C. And at some point in history, they found actually one of the chisels that was used to make one of the buildings, which I forgot which building it was used for. And they told this whole you know, historical fiction story that was centered around that object. And sometimes the object was just played a, you know, a natural part in it. Sometimes it was more important. Um, but it was really ended up being you know, one of those things you do, and it just turns out so much better um, than you think it was. Um, <laughs> this one is kind of funny. Um, for years, I stopped doing posters uh, because you know posters are bad, right? Um, we're supposed to be using all this tech stuff. And I, 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 I was watching a video. I forgot his name. Um, Kevin Hodgkin. I, Hodge, I forgot how you say his last name. If you're on Twitter, he is, uh, yes, Peggy, him. Um, and he did a video that was called 20 Steps. And it was basically he took 20 steps in his school. He shot a video. So he took 20 steps, shot a video. Took 20 steps, shot a video. And it kind of showed you all about his, you know, what was going on in school. So when I walked in the next day, I took 20 steps and I looked around. And I saw blank walls. And I took 20 more steps, blank walls. Went all the way up to my class. And all of a sudden I realized that you could walk through my entire school and not have a clue what was actually going on in all the classrooms. And so that was it. <laughs> we decided, I decided to start making more stuff. Uh, Jackie, good find. That's the one right there. Um, and so I started making more stuff. And we made these posters. And again, you know, it's not a poster on what are the three foods most eaten in Iceland. Uh, but what we did is we studied John Locke. This was before you know, things leading up to the American Revolution, uh, Declaration of Independence, that sort of thing. And the kids drew posters of what John Locke would look like if he was alive today. So based on John Locke's philosophies and what he wrote about uh, you know, a few hundred years ago, if John Locke was being looked for today, what kind of person would we look for? And you can see the kids drew all sorts of neat things. And um, uh, they had their explanations. Some put them on the front, some put them on the back. But it was a really, ended up being a really cool project. And I was just blown away by how like, later in the year somebody would be. And just the connections were phenomenal later in the year. Uh, and just a, another example of uh, one of the posters. Um, yeah. And another little twist, posters are hard to present. And you, know, you hold the poster up in front of the room, nobody can see it. And so what we do is we put the posters on the table, and we use a webcam. And right now, uh, Lily is not zoomed in on anything. But as she talked about each thing, she zoomed in on it. And so it's kind of like kids are watching a video in the front of the class. Um, and it's a great way to, to show the posters instead of just you know, holding it up in front and just talking, 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 talking. Kind of keeps the uh, folks involved. Um, and there's just another example of a poster a kid did this year. Uh, this is on Shay's Rebellion. And she basically created her own wordle 
and she put it inside the body of Daniel Shea. And if you read the wordle and you read the key words that she picked, um, they're all, uh, you know, by the time you get to his lack of feet, <laughs> you kind of understand what, what went on with Daniel Shea. Um, and so after the flips, after the uh, posters, we did some, you know, something else, but then the posters came down and I wanted to stick something else up in the classroom. So we did a project called Footsteps, and this one we did um, on the Trail of Tears. And what the kids did is they had 10 steps to tell what was going on in the head of a soldier or one of the Native Americans. And in every footstep, they had to put one thought. And so from, you know, from the beginning of the trail, so the first footstep represented either, you know, the soldiers coming to their house or the first step of them leaving their home. And then the last step represented them being uh, in their new homes. And these footsteps, it was wild. There were footsteps everywhere, all, all going up and down lockers, all going down all across the hallways. It was ridiculously awesome. Custodian came in and he's like, what are those footsteps doing up on the window? And I was like, oh, my kids couldn't have done that. And I go outside. We have these windows. Someone must have stepped up onto a railing. And if you can see where Alex is pointing, there's one of those 10 feet up. They must have walked across the ledge. And then they put footsteps up all across the top of the top windows, which I don't know. I, I think they broke some OSHA regulations there. Um, but it was really cool, you know, just because it's different, watching kids walk in the hallway and kind of taking a look at what people wrote. And because they're short and to the point, you could just slowly walk by these things and read every single one. And then each day, read a different set of footprints. So it was, it was pretty cool. Um, Show and tell with a twist. Um, when we did the Constitution this year, <laughs> this, this was their assessment for their Constitution. You ready for this? Um, Maureen, you, do you translate the project? Yes, the projects get translated into letter grades. Um, uh, usually at the end of the marking period, I'll just you know, kind of ask the kids, what grade do you think you should have gotten and why? And uh, I've realized that over time, nobody's ever more than 5% away from what I would have given them. Uh, there's always a couple outliers, but usually it's the same. And uh, with the rubrics questions, no, I, I do not use rubrics. If you think about it, a rubric, let's say you have a rubric one, two, three, four, basically what you're giving the kid is you're giving them a piece of paper and 75% of the piece of paper is telling them what not to do. And so when I do give something out that's concrete, um, I'm giving them what the equivalent is of the four on the rubric. And nothing gets turned in and accepted unless they've completed that four column. So if they have to have a certain type of thesis sentence, if they need three of this or four of that, if they walk up with two, they sit right back down. If they come in with, you know, one out of three things, they sit right back down um, and it doesn't get accepted. Uh, you know, if they came up with a poster on John Locke and it was supposed to include, you know, four different sources and you were supposed to analyze them, they only did three, they, they don't even go. Um, so there you go. <laughs> so the, the show and tell with the twist, they came in and I told them I was going to give them a test on the Constitution and they said, well, you don't give tests, we don't take tests. And I said, no, no, you're getting one tomorrow. So when they walked into the class, I told every kid to grab an object from the room. And so every kid just grabbed a random thing from the room. And, and I told them, all right, now what you have to do is I'm going to give you, you know, five or ten minutes to prepare. You're going to come up and talk to me, talk to the class about how your object is like the Constitution. And holy smokes, it really, it caught me off guard with it just how they just blew me away. Um, and, you know, it sounds so simple. Like right now I'm in my cellar and I'm, I just grabbed the first thing next to me and I'm, I, it's a bottle of glue. And so if you thought about like how is glue like the Constitution? You know, at first you have no thoughts, but I bet you if you keep thinking, you can talk about, you know, it holds things together, you know, on and on and on. Um, and the, the depth in which the kids made connections was uh, just simply awesome. And messy, Maureen, yes. <laughs> um, P-Day. You've probably heard of P-Day. If you on Twitter, you've probably heard it as Genius Hour, and you've heard it as 20% time, and you've heard it as all these other things. And uh, I think, uh, you know, a lot of the people that write about Genius Hour and 20% um, time think about it as a, a new thing, and it's not. Um, you know, doing what you love and researching what you love is the original way in, that people learn. It's the way that people learn most naturally. And so I think the biggest mistake we do is when we talk about adding in 
a genius hour to our class or adding in uh, a 20% time simply because that should be all day, every day in school. Um, I think more talk should be about why we are not doing it all the hours of our day instead of talking about it as this special project that we do for special purpose, you know, this, that, and the other thing. Um, so we've been doing it for, I don't know, uh, we, I don't know 10 years or so in, in all different formats um, well before 20% you know, became famous. Um, I first actually started calling it 4545, which was we did it the day before Thanksgiving, and the kids got 45 minutes to research something, and then they had 45 seconds to present. And then it got longer and longer from there. Um, what we currently do now is any five-day week, they get the Friday to do whatever they'd like to do. So, you know, if it's a four-day week, if there's a special pre uh, presentation, if there's a snow day, then they don't get that day to do their work. Um, and, you know, it starts off very slow. I mean, these people who write about Genius Hour and show these incredible things their kids are doing, I don't know where those kids come from. Um, but most kids, you know, when I talk about this at conferences, you know, basically they just sit. <laughs> they just simply sit day after, in my case, Friday after Friday, just waiting for directions. And it takes them so long to figure out that they're, they can't wait for anything, that they have to self-direct this. And the other thing, too, in talking with my kids is that they don't have many passions. Um, they don't know what to do. And they talk about how in school they're self-directed all the time, or not self-directed, they are directed all the time to do things. So when you give them the opportunity to do what they want, unless you have that special group of students, they're just going to sit there. And so it took me a while to just suck it up and realize that it's going to take three, four, five, some kids, six, seven, eight months before things started to click. And some things might, some kids might go through, you know, 20 different topics before they find something. And we talk about it as dating versus marriage. Um, so when we start researching anything, including stuff for PDA, we're just dating. You know, you're kind of learning about new things. You're not making any long-term commitment. And then eventually you find someone or something or some topic, and then you make that commitment to them, and you go into that relationship wholeheartedly. And that's what they end up picking for their PDA presentation. Um, and again, you know, there were topics. This is a picture from a, a sculpting class. Um, she did the, and every kid, to make it legal, the one thing that I throw in for the kids that if this, anybody walked into my class, um, they have to have, make a connection to the 19th century. That's the history that we do in my class. So uh, this girl did sculpting, and she connected, you know, did some 19th century sculpting history, and then everybody had clay, and she took them and gave them uh, some lessons on sculpting. Uh, this girl's, three girls did some dance. Uh, if you look in, the, and I put this picture in because if you look in the background, you can kind of see our board that we tried to schedule everybody on. Uh, so we took two days of school, the last two full days of school, and the kids took over our team. There were no teachers doing anything. The kids set up the schedule. The kids created the presentations. The kids set up the classrooms. The kids hooked up the technology. Um, the kids led everything. Uh, they just they didn't, we didn't even have a, an official schedule. They, they went wherever they wanted to go to, and there were no problems. Um, we did have a cutoff of, like, I think some classes, 30 kids, um, because we just, you know, couldn't fit everybody in one room. But that was the only thing we really had to do. And, uh, again, all sorts of kids that are able to present on things that they would have never have gotten to in a normal school. This girl would have never have gotten to talk about her passion of turtles in a normal classroom. And uh, listening to the history of turtles and the connection to 19th century mariners was absolutely fascinating. Uh, and this is just a little chunk of our schedule, just to give you an idea of uh, some of the things the kids did. This year, there was a lot of stuff. I can't, whether it was a blip or I can't figure out why, but there were a lot of sports. A lot of people just did sports, sports, sports. Um, and uh, that's the end. 
Um, I put this slide in there to appease any of the Southern NASCAR fans, uh, but that's the end of the presentation. And, you know, at this point, uh, when some of you try some of these assessments, you might feel like you're going over the edge and it's a little scary, uh, but uh, fear not. Pick one, do it with the kids, and, uh, you know, you have a blast. Holy smokes, that's it. <laughs> How is that? <laughs> Anybody laugh? Paul, I do think most everybody's still here. <laughs> I kind of forgot how fast I was talking and how long and I was talking. And you captured most of the questions, <laughs> oh questions that popped up in chat. I did You're find crazy. one more, <laughs> and this went back to the Thousand Words project. Did they storyboard or anything else similar to that before they strung together their Thousand Words in advance? Oh yeah, there was a lot, I mean basically what they, they don't realize it, but they wrote an essay, you know, so I, I didn't call it an essay, I didn't call it, mm -hmm. but they still had to analyze right, the different so parts. Was, yeah. yeah, so they had a, a well thought out script um, beforehand. And even with, a, I have mm -hmm. to, you know, kind of appease the school gods and produce so many essays. So even with some of the things like the RSA, the day afterwards they'll say, all right, we're going to write an essay on the Louisiana Purchase, and the kids are like, no, 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 I'll like, take out your scripts, you know, neaten up your introduction, make sure that it's, you know, you, you just put it into your, you know, paragraph instead of how you wrote it out, and you, you already wrote the essay. So it's, you know, you're using mm -hmm. those same skills, and you're not using that, that evil word that kids have grown to hate so much, you know? Carolyn's asking about your Two Floors Up project for the fall. Could you say something about that? Yes, Carol. Can you throw in the link? Oops, I think I just. Carol, um, I'm afraid to touch my computer, <laughs> so that it will stop no, working. Is working. <laughs> yes. So I'm afraid to touch it. But if uh, if you can grab my last blog post, I think the last one was on it, if I remember correctly. Yeah, because it was just yesterday. Um, the uh, the two floors up, we have a, an abandoned room in our classroom last year, and at the very end of the year, uh, I finally got permission to kind of take it over, and we made it into an audio, video, photography studio, uh, just basically a, a place that didn't smell like school, where kids can go and kind of work on these passions, um, a place that is simply is quiet, or they can be loud. Um, you know, a place where they can go and record themselves singing or just, you know, do some video editing. And so uh, last year, at the, after that happened at the end of the year, there was a seventh grade position that opened up. Uh, I applied and I got it and sitting right next door, one of the draws of the seventh grade position was right next door. There wasn't another abandoned room that was bigger. So I got permission to move it all downstairs. And it was a, just after, after taking a month to set up the room, it was kind of a little disheartening to take it all down, but I think in the end it'll be better. And one of the things I want to do with the room is I want to open it up after school. And, you know, we have all these kids who have this, you know, this, this arts passion that just it doesn't have a place in school. And I know we have a phenomenal, you know, band and chorus teacher and arts teacher, but, you know, the kids who are in band, um, I'm not trying to necessarily hit those, but I'm trying to hit that kid who spends all night playing guitar in his, class, in his, you know, room, or that girl who's just always singing in front of the mirror and has no place in school to do that, and draw them in and make it into a, a middle school performance venue, um, and also open it up to, you know, the kids in high school that came through our middle school, and kind of do a once a month show, because there, there's no place like that for them to go. Um, you know, kids are more passionate about music than when I was in middle school, it's, it's, it's incredible. And whether they're playing or whether they're listening. And so I, I really want to create a place where they can come and perform and hone those talents. And also just a place where kids can come and listen. Um, you know, kind of that, that safe place. They can't go to the club. They can't go to the wherever at their age. Um, so just a place to kind of come and, and hang out. And, uh, you know, I, I always go back to that Ken Robinson talk with that girl who was the dancer who had to leave school to find her place. And instead of having these kids leave school physically or mentally, I want to create that place in this building, um, you know, in a, in a place that doesn't smell like school, uh, a place that they can kind of call home. You know, some kids call the football field home. And there's a whole lot of other kids that just, 
don't have that place in school. So that's that's what I'm trying to create. Um, mm -hmm. Our last big thing was uh, a speaker system and a few cameras, and so that's what the Kickstarter campaign is all about. Um, I'm giving Kickstarter a little experiment. Uh, I know a few schools have tried it, a couple with success and most with failure. Um, but I'm thinking that mine is a, it's kind of a catchy idea, I hope. And uh, already within 24 hours, I think, uh, I haven't looked at it you know, since this morning, but I think we're up to almost 400 bucks or something like that. So we're getting there. That's great. Somebody asked, what happens in other social studies classrooms in their school? Um, I'm going to answer that. I'm going to yell up to my someone to bring me a power cord. So one <laughs> second. I'm just going to scream. I hope it doesn't come out that loud. Annie! Bring me the power cord for the laptop! <laughs> you get that on the recording? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep, all of it. <laughs> um, yeah, I ran away from my daughter's room without the power cord. Um, I, I'm not going to answer that question. And mm -hmm. I hope you don't mind, but I know this is a public recording, right. and I'd, you know, I'd, I'd rather not answer right. what's going on in the rest of the school. Sure, I understand that, yeah. and that probably goes along with this question too. I know you are a social studies teacher, but are you aware of any favorite assessments used by French and Spanish teachers, particularly for oral assessment? That's a little different. <laughs> you might be able to. Well, I'll tell you, I sat that yesterday. I sat yesterday in a project-based learning session with foreign language teachers. It was being run by foreign language teachers. There was me and one other person who wasn't. And I think that was the session that I referred to in which the person brought up the no card confessions. Mm -hmm. And so and that is one that could be done. Um, I think you mentioned oral. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, really, almost anything that I, I went through, you know, can be done orally instead of written up in front of the class instead of a video. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'll give you one example I said to the lady yesterday. She was doing a uh, unit on greetings. And just even, you know, a simple simulation of create a cafe. You know, when the kids walk in, change your tables around change, or go up to the cafeteria and, you know, you can set up something where for that day that, that your classroom is going to be a small cafe and some people are waiters and some people are customers and some people are the owners and some people are whoever and everybody's got to do so many greetings in so many ways um, and again, I was a little more precise <laughs> yesterday with more time mm -hmm. um, but just something, you know, that simple instead of telling the kids, all right, you got to go home and memorize the, the ten, whatever, I'm going to make this up, you know, the ten most common greetings that they use to, that, to actually come in and use them in a situation, um, especially out loud, you know, and use them continuously. So not just on one question on a test, but to use it continuously as you greet the waiter, as the owner comes over and you greet, the, you know, and so forth and so on. Um, so I don't know. I, I, but I, again, I think it just takes a little bit of creativity to twist a lot of the things that I did for any subject. Um, and I've been really amazed at the different subjects teachers who have taken what I've done and, and twisted it. I've mm -hmm. seen some great science projects using the RSA videos. Um, where they've done uh, different scientific terms with the RSA video. Uh, so a calculus teacher um, who took the, what was it, the, um, ah, the uh, Common Craft video and did like a calculus problems with it with their kid, mm -hmm. kids. Um, so, you know, it's, I think at first it's kind of like you get stuck saying, oh, it's social studies projects. But as soon as your brain starts twisting things, I think, man, it just starts coming. Um, and, and Bobby, I use all of them as neither. How's that? I, I really, I, I, the question was, do you use these assessments for formative or summative? If I had to pick one, I'm going to go formative because I really use each thing the kids do to build and figure out what I'm doing next. You know, there, there's no end to the learning. Uh, I think one of the biggest mistakes that we do is teaching units and pretend that, okay, this unit is over, here comes the next one. Um, and so, you know, I, I realized that if you walked into class, it would kind of appear as though it was a summative, um, but I, I like to look at them as formative. And for the formative assessments, I do a lot of talking. You know, if you think about it, we give tests and quizzes in class, and I, I know someone can challenge me on this one, but we give tests and quizzes in class simply because we can't have a face-to-face -face conversation. 
You know, if, if you only had, think about it, if you only had one kid in your classroom, would you make them sit down and take a test or would you talk to them? So really, you know, our summative assessments that we give are just excuses for having too many kids in a classroom. Um, and so I try to do as much face-to-face -face stuff while they're working on them. And if they're working on a multi-day project, then it gives me time to do that. Um, there is the state testing, Maureen. We, we have to do, um, you know, the SBACs, the, well, that's not necessarily state. Um, my district has put in these performance assessments at the end of each unit. And, uh, you know, everybody's got to look the same and that sort of thing. But I, I still think there's some loopholes built in where we've been able to include some of our, like for example, that uh, dear, dear wife one on the Civil War that I showed, uh, I used that for one of my district assessments. You know, I think if a normal person read what we were supposed to have done, there's no way they could see that being fit, uh, fitting what we're supposed to be doing. But I think, um, you know, if I had to sit down with an administrator, I can make enough connections and show that I basically did what I was supposed to do just in a whole different format. Um, <laughs> that's a great question, Amy. Um, well, no, there, there's not a lot of pushback. What's surprising is that if you look at my end of the year evaluations that I give the kids, um, one of the words that comes up most to describe my class is hard and challenging. And so if a lot of kids get A's or B's, there's never a feeling that it's easy. Um, and frankly, I think kids stop caring. Uh, you know, nobody really cares what they're getting. Uh, and as long as, you know, I, we have that attitude in class that everybody's doing their best, you know, because you're doing things in class that you enjoy, you, 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 know, you do a good job on them. Um, and, you know, even kids who end up doing poorly will still sometimes come up to me and say, you know what, I deserve an A for that. And, you know, here's my reasons, and here's what went wrong, and here's what I would do differently next time. Um, so, yeah, with the admin and parents, uh, there's no pushback because there are definitely not all A's and B's. Um, at, at probably in the first two quarters or so, <laughs> I, I hate saying this, but I will often have more kids uh, failing my class than any other. Um, and again, it's kind of funny because people have this perception of my class as being so simple and he gives A's and B's. And two years ago, the administrator decided to email every single kid who was failing in the class and what teacher they belonged to. And it was, a, I think, a shock to a lot of people who came up to me and said, uh, whoa, so uh, we didn't realize you had so many kids failing. And, you know, and on my end and my parents' end, they all know the kids aren't failing. They just haven't hit that mark yet. Um, and by the end of the year, it's never, ever, ever, ever like that. Um, yeah, and Peggy, kids can be harder uh, grading themselves. Uh, but I think, you know, because it's a part of the fabric of the class, um, that I think they grade themselves fairly. Uh, and, and again, there's always an outlier. There's always a kid at the top who's always giving themselves 100. There's always a kid at the bottom who is always saying, oh, I should fail, fail, fail. And, you know, that, that's, that's more, that's kids who need, you know, have some issues going on. But again, I, I've never really found kids who grade themselves outside of a five-point mark of what I would have given them. And when it comes right down to it, if it's a, you know, if I said, oh, I think I would have given this kid an 83 and they put down 88, I mean, if you're going to tell me that I couldn't have done 5% of stuff different to have helped off that kid, I think there's definitely a 5% margin of error. And so I always end up going with the kids. Um, and even if it's lower than mine, I'll, I'll go with the kids. And, yeah. <laughs> All right, what else? There was a question about uh, do you ever give tests? No. Standard <laughs> tests. No. I thought I thought that was the answer, but I thought I'd also better ask the question. No, you know, I and it's really who would who who wants one? Who wants, mm -hmm. you know, what type of person is motivated to learn by a test? What type of person starts to learn something new and is motivated to do their best in it because there's going to be a test at the end? I think uh, just across the board, it's a turnoff. 
You know, the only th only mm -hmm. people that get turned on by tests are teachers. And the reason why teachers get turned on by tests, and sorry, I'm going to offend somebody in the audience, is because you like them as kids. Because, you know, most teachers become teachers because they did well in school and they liked school. You are very good at sitting at a desk in a row for seven hours a day without causing problems. You are very good at memorizing things and then spitting them back on a test, and you got your A's and B's. So then you, came, you come into teaching and you reproduce the class that you were most successful with. And, you know, I, I think that's part of our biggest problem is that we have teachers in America that are just reproducing what works for them and not doing what works for the other, you know, 98% of the world that didn't become teachers. Um, and I think if we stopped just for a second and had some conversations with kids and stopped and just did that outer body experience, just step out of your body and take a look at yourself in the kid's view. And I say this to people all the time, video yourself. Don't actually, don't video yourself. Put a video, I think when we say like videotape teachers, we always put the video on the teacher. Put the camera behind you and just watch your kids' faces during the course of the class and let me know, you know, if you're not going to change stuff immediately after watching that, the first two minutes of that video. Um, you know, and so I, I think we need to start thinking a little differently and giving tests. I, you know, it doesn't cut it. It doesn't cut it. Nobody does work for a test. You're not making anything. There's no craft there. It's just a, a spit back. And no matter how complicated you think you can make a test with great multiple choice or a great essay, you're still not creating anything. It's just spitting back some thoughts. And, uh, you know, that's just, for most of the kids in your classroom, that, that's just not going to cut it. Thank you, Paul. I think it's time now to wrap up our show for today. Thank you very much for having me. You're quite welcome. Thanks for, for persevering through all the issues today. Uh, Peggy, are you going to, to do the upcoming show? Yes. I Thank you so much, Paul. That was worth waiting for. And we'll do a little editing on that uh, recording, so it will be great when we get it posted. We really appreciate you. I'm just going to do one quick um, announcement about our upcoming sh shows because we'd love to have you come back. Next Saturday, we're going to be teaching you about 81 Dash, which is an amazing back channel tool for students that is totally safe. And the creator and developer of that app is Carlos Fernandez, and he's going to be here. Tell us about it. Then we'll skip a week with no show for Labor Day holiday. We'll have Joan Young on September. September 6th, talking about all kinds of strategies you can use to encourage kids in the classroom. We have a great Live Finder presentation about kids and learning about careers on September 13th, and a great show with Pernille Rip on the Global Read Aloud Project on September 20th. So we hope you'll come back and join us for those shows. And with that, we're just going to go right on to say, your survey should pop up at the end when you log out. And if it doesn't, you'll find it right on the Live Binder under the Classroom 2.0 Live Resources. So you can submit it that way. And we just want to say, Thank you, Paul, for a fabulous presentation. And thank you all for joining us and for hanging in there. And I'll be adding your links to the Live Binder um, after the show is over. So be sure to log out, and we'll um, get that recording process. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>